Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I am Jeannie King, a Partnership Specialist on NASA Glenn Research Center's Technology Transfer Expansion Team. Before we get started, I'd like to point out that your microphones will be muted throughout the entire presentation. During this event, we will unveil and showcase the new SMMD tool, tool via a demonstration, review shape memory technologies available for licensing, ways to engage NASA, and then we will uh, finish up with a Q&A. So along the way, if you have questions, please type them in the chat box in the lower right corner of your screen, and we will address those at the end. For those questions we do not get to today, we will do our best to answer those in the next week or so via email. So off to the main event. Super excited today about the official launch of this Shape Memory Material Database tool and even more excited to participate in this demonstration with the inventor himself. It is a real treat that we will be joined today by Dr. Benefan. So just a little bit about him. Dr. Benefan has been working at NASA Glenn Research Center since 2011. He is a materials research engineer in the high temperature and smart alloys branch, leading the development of shape memory alloy technologies. He leads multiple teams in the design of lightweight actuators and morphing structures and supports several space act agreements with industry partners. Dr. Benefan has published over 68 peer reviewed journal articles, 25 conference proceedings, and currently holds five issued patents. He is very active in the technical community, serving numerous roles is the president of the International Organization on Shape Memory and Superelastic Technologies and the past executive chairman of the Joint Industry Government Academia Consortium for the Advancement of Shape Memory Alloy Research and Technology. Dr. Benefan has received numerous awards during his career, including the NASA Abe Silverstein Medal, the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers and the R&D 100 Award. So it is with pleasure that I introduce one of our great innovators, esteemed subject matter experts and friend, Dr. Atman Benefan. Thank you, Jeannie, for that introduction. All right, I'm sharing my screen. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, like Jeannie said, my name is Atman Benefan. I'm from the High Temperature and Smart Alloys Branch at NASA Glenn Research Center. Uh, let me find my pointer. All right, so before we dive into today's topic, I just wanted to give you a little perspective on why and, and how this work started. I have worked with shape memory materials, specifically shape memory alloys since my undergrad. And I have always been fascinated, not only by the unique properties of these materials, but more so by how any little thing can change their properties. So it was very difficult for me to compare across uh, different alloying elements, like for example, cobalt or platinum, or across different material systems, if nitide versus copper aluminum, or even different uh, material uh, types, shape memory alloys versus shape memory polymers, for example. Also now, as a, as a material developer, I wanted to speed up the, the development phase the time it takes from project needs to the final product. Uh, just a reminder, shape memory alloys, most of you know, but shape memory alloys and shape memory materials are mainly developed based on the empirical methods, the, the trial and error type approach, and they're largely based on the individual experience or the secret sauce, so to speak, that a scientist or an organization may hold. So, I thought to myself, these materials have existed for over six decades, since the 1960s or so. There must be a database somewhere. Well, I looked around and I found something, but it wasn't what I was looking for. There are some handbooks with very limited data. Uh, some of them have less than, say, 100 or 120 data points, for example. Mostly dealing with one material system, the famous one, nitinol or nickel titanium. And that data wasn't... wasn't really recent with the new science that was brought forth in, in recent years. Then I said, all right, if a database doesn't exist, there must be some software package out there to help us design alloys. 
Same procedure, I looked around and find thermodynamic models with phase diagrams, uh, some ab initio models and some basic uh, machine learning tools. Once again, this solution was not close to satisfying the need. These packages are very much incomplete or some of them don't have the, the, the correct data, if you will. Uh, some of the uh, ab initio models are progressing, making progress, but not there yet. The progress is being made. Great things have, seen, have, have come out in recent years, but it's just not there yet. So not having a database, not having such a tool quickly uh, uh, becomes a, a problem. For example, it becomes a problem in, 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 in quickly difficult, quickly and effectively uh, comparing data. Of course, you can go out there and get thousands of published uh, publications, reports, books, and what have you, but that will take you some serious time. There's also the information loss and research duplication. How many people do you think have tested a, a let's say, a 50.8 nickel titanium atomic percent to get a supoelastic curve? Probably hundreds. But again, the data is not necessarily in the database. It's, it's hard to find sometimes. Also, not having that pool of data in front of you makes it a little bit hard to identify gaps and potential opportunities that may lead you to some new discovery, new alloy formulation. And of course, uh, data is power. If you don't have data, your AI or your, your machine learning models stand no chance. So for these reasons, uh, we started working to build a, what we call the NASA Shape Marine Materials Database and Analysis Tool. We did that to provide a data platform of shape marine materials, uh, sort of a one-stop shop to visualize, to analyze, to, to discover new alloys, and also to inspire the next generation of shape marine materials practitioners. The tool was developed for NASA needs to start with, with these uh, key building blocks that you see here. Uh, so you'll have the ability to view data and generate plots. Uh, the ease and, and to down-select or to search for an alloy by applying search filters and links. The capability to perform simple analysis to guide you throughout the process. The tool that allows you to share data and compare data, and also to learn from it to make the decision, the right decisions when you are designing something. And here, of course, in the model section, uh, platform. this platform is for experimentalists and for modelers alike. The data can be used to validate models, uh, train, um, machine learning routines, calibrate, and so on. All of this was developed within some sort of an integrated plan, a, a schema, if you will, that didn't fit existing platforms. And most of you know that shape marine alloys are special and unique in terms of properties and the way they're handled. So to give you an idea, here's a, a, a schema for this work in this slide. First, we start with the reference data from publications, uh, reports, or, or books. Also, you can have experimental data or even virtual data, model data. That data is captured with the pedigree and metadata. Okay. Based on first the material type, is it shape memory alloy, shape memory polymer, or whatever that is. And then it flows to the next tier, which is the formulation. Under the formulation, we capture the chemistries, the densities, uh, uh, things like uh, stoichiometry or number of valence electrons, and so on and also information corresponding to processing. How do you melt the alloy? How do you heat treat it? Maybe you need to break it down and so on. Along this process, we capture the test information uh, that could be relevant to, to you or to most ship memory alloy work. Uh, that comes in the form of, of test type, DSC or UPFR, whatever that is, along with statistical data like number of papers, years of publications and, and that sort of statistical information. So this block feeds, in the, feeds in into the data, sets the stage, uh, so to speak, for the property, which is organized into this 2D and 3D data in scatter plots. It's also organized into ternary diagrams to look into uh, uh, phase compositions and elements, and even if you want to go into higher elements, that gives you the capabilities to capture this higher elemental and their effect on the properties, on the alloy, what, what, what happens in there. All a subset of that data, or all of that data, uh, whatever the user decides, can be used 
and can be analyzed. So we have some basic tools that you see here, like clustering and regression. Uh, and future, we'll have more advanced analysis tools like machine learning, for example. And this is all the time linked to the data pool. So and on the fly, you can add or remove data and see how the models or your clustering regressions is doing, if you're fitting data, or if you're trying to come up with some slopes or, or whatnot. A big part, a huge part of this framework is traceability. So what we wanted to do here, every single data point is linked to the source, where it came from, whether it's a paper, a vendor, a report, a conference, whatever, it can be linked to that researcher, to that vendor or some lab. So in, in a way, we really wanted to link the user to the, to the originator. So this presents the overall uh, construct of this work and all of it boils down to this uh, slide here, which I'm in a minute, I'm going to go to the live demonstration. This graphical user interface that you see here, uh, uh, and by the way, I'm happy to report that, that this can be accessed uh, right after this presentation via this link. So if you want to point it down and, and try it, uh, anybody in the world can have access to it. So if I navigate to this, uh, to this site, let me switch screens here. This is the actual uh, database tool. Uh, uh, you can go to this link and it's going to be accessible, like I said, just after this one. So first thing is this links on the top gives you the material type, whether you're working with shape memory alloys, super elastic alloys, magnetic SMAs, shape memory polymers, or ceramics. You get to select what type of material you're going to work with. Next, if I select shape memory alloys, this menu is now tailored to that option and you can choose the material system. Now you may be asking, what material system? I mean, I have here a nickel titanium base, for example. Most of us know about nickel titanium or nitinol or trade name out there. But did you know that there are some 16 other material bases that also exhibit ship memory properties? And the way to access that is simply by this drop-down menu. You can access silver base, gold base, copper based, and so on. Nickel titanium is right here. Nickel tantalum is here uranium, zirconium, and so on. You can mix and match. You can look at one of them at a time, but all these material bases are available. Next, you have this uh, menu. It wants you select what material system you're going to be looking at. Now we have the axis controls. The axis controls is the x-axis, the y-axis, and we have a color bar along with what kind of plot type you need to look at. And here are different plot types, scatter plot, ternary, box and whisker, and, and sunburst. Okay. Down here, you have data filters. Let's say you select some data and you want to apply some processing method filter, test types, or test direction. If there are other filters that you want to use, for example, you only want to look at some hysteresis between point A and B, you can choose that here and do a min and max. Down here is the section where we have the analysis tool, which I will also be showing you in a minute. Here is you have clustering methods, uh, fuzzy clustering or statistics based, and you also have regression method, both linear and polynomial are included. So let's start at the high level. Let's look at this chart, for example, what we call the sunburst chart. This sunburst chart here, it looks like a pie chart that provides an overview of the reference statistics like how many papers and from which category uh, and so on. So here for nickel titanium base, it's showing there are about 1600 or so papers. In the nickel titanium based alloys, you can add copper and just the copper are, there are 370 papers if you click on the copper and then you have the quaternary elements it's gonna be nickel, titanium, copper, hafnium and it's telling you there is 23 reference in the database. So basically just a, a little bit of information on, on how things are flowing. And, 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 and you can do that for all these uh, uh, categories of materials. Uh, next one, uh, let's look at the box and whisker here. We have this box and whisker plot shown here. So if you select this box and whisker, it's going to populate a chart. And this chart here, they are uh, showing you the number of elements on the x-axis that have this kind of properties. So if you're interested, for example, in actuation strains, you can plot the number of properties, number of elements added 
to the nickel titanium base. Remember that you are in nickel titanium and you're adding element to it. And this tells you what is the actuation strain. If you choose to select some other temperature, let's say austenite starts or something like that, austenite finish is here, then you can see that this is plotted as a function of, of many, many other elements here. And just visually, just quickly, you can tell, uh, uh, you know, which one is, for example, high temperature, which one is potentially low temperature, so you can focus uh, directly into the elements that you're going to be working with. So that gives you that idea of the box and whisker. And if I uh, come up here again, back to the presentation, you can create this plot for ship memory alloys. You can create this plot for shape memory polymers, and there's a huge category in the database of them, or shape memory or super elastic alloys. Either either one kind of works the same way. All right. So let's move on to a more focused engineering data. Uh, let's go back to the live demo. I'm going to be switching back and forth here. Let's say you want to design an alloy, and you want to know compositions. And these compositions are best presented in this case if we go to a ternary diagram. Ternary diagram have different names, uh, Gibbs uh, charts and so on. But a ternary plot looks like something like this. If I choose an element that is hafnium, remember this is hafnium added to the nickel titanium. And now I go to my ternary plot and it looks something like this. Now this plot offers uh, a lot of information. Here you have your three elements, nickel and titanium and hafnium, for example. And then you have the symbols here. And then you have a color plot. The color plot in this case of nickel makes no sense because you already have nickel presented. But what if we come here and do, I don't know, hysteresis? If you're interested in hysteresis, you can look at number of alloys that exist with that information along with the hysteresis. Now, here's something that is very, uh, very important here. What if you want to know what's the effect of higher elemental addition on the compositions here. All you have to do, you come back to this graphical user interface. Again, we are nickel titanium based alloys. You pick the elements that you want. Let's say half name for presentation purposes. This is a ternary diagram, but now we want to know higher additions. You click on this quant upper elemental additions, for example, quaternary. And then you get the different symbols, nickel, titanium, hafnium, rhenium, zirconium, copper, and so on. And this allows you in a 3D, in a ternary diagram, you can visualize the quaternary elemental addition based on site preference. So we look at what elements replaces what, and we put it along with that element instead of building a quaternary phase diagram, if you will. Right? So that information here, if I switch back to my presentation, allows you to really carve up very important information. Phase diagram that shows you the three elements, like shown here. The symbols in this case shows you the processing method, whether it's a single crystal or if it was a vacuum arc melted or maybe vacuum induction melted. And the color map allows you to plot out the next piece of information like cost. And here we chose to plot the estimated cost. So if you're dealing with iron versus uh, uh, another element like hafnium, uh, the cost cost factor is different. So speaking of this processing methods, and I touched a, a little bit on that, if you ever worked with shape memory alloys or processing them, you know how critical that is. So melting practices are important. Uh, why use VIM versus VAR? What kind of impurities are associated with each melting technique? You could also look at heat treatments where you need to know about uh, annealing temperatures or maybe aging schedules or you need to break down the ingot, you need to convert it to rod or roll it. We have that information captures into the, in, into the, uh, uh, the database tool, and it comes in, in, in this form. So this information is qualitative in nature, but it provides a starting point. An example here shown for nickel, titanium, silver. From the database, you can pull this information. For example, it tells you that if you have nitro silver, you can homogenize it at these temperatures, and then you can hot work it or cold work it at these temperatures, and then you can heat treat it at these temperatures. If you might make in, this is vacuum arc melted. If you decide to make in another method, if you want to sputter it, we give you the pressures and the temperatures along with the annealing temperatures. If you start with a powder metallurgy process, you need to know about the hipping process, for instance, the temperatures and pressures, and also about the solutionizing or heat treatment temperature. All this information can be pulled from the database, 
by going, for example, into let's let's give you a different flavor. Let's go scatter plot. Let's go to copper here. This information comes through. Uh, not necessarily. Let's do uh, palladium. We're familiar with that. Single elements here, just nitite palladium. And here, if you look at this information and you go to the filters, which I described before, you can now start filtering just the one that she wants. You want a vacuum arc melted, spotted, or vacuum induction melted, or, uh, for example, single crystal method bridgement technique, for example, here, and you can filter that way. And then if you want to know the heat treatments, you simply come to the x-axis here. You can type in the heat treatment number one, which is typically homogenization. Heat treatment number two, typically annealing or solutionization. Heat treatment number three is typically aging heat treatment. So you can click on either one of those and you can have those information pop and you can create your processing chart just like I showed you. All right. So let me go here now to spend a little bit more time uh, to describe this interface in the middle. This interface allows you again uh, to choose the elements added to the nickel titanium based, let's say copper, for instance. Next, you have these uh, unique features here. So let's say you just want to look at nickel, titanium, copper, and everything that comes with it, all these properties, martensite finish, strains, and temperatures, and hardness, and whatever, whatever property exists out there. You can do that. You can look at it in the scatter plot. You can look at it in the alternative plot like I showed you and whatnot. But what if you want to compare different elements, just like my initial problem when I was in grad school? I want to compare nickel, titanium, copper with everything else. So what you do is you click on this multi-element and it allows you to directly hit other elements, whatever they are, and compare them. And just to make something meaningful here, let me just do, uh, for example, X elements will be the ternary element that you're adding. And here we can do austenite finish, or, or let's do here martensite. I like martensite finish. You get this kind of trend, and this allows you to compare all this addition to the nickel, titanium, copper, hafnium, palladium, or really you can click on all of them. And please look how fast this, this is responding. Barely, you don't have to wait for the data to populate. And it tells you roughly how many data points you are plotting out. So that's this multi-element button right here. Now, let's say if you want to work on single elements, and you want to look at the quaternary addition. So if I come to the quaternary addition on the hafnium, it's going to tell you all the quaternary addition and their effect. Again, you can plot anything here. Here we can now just, just plot the hafnium, for instance, because I'm dealing with hafnium. And you can plot the uh, osni starts or finish. And you can see this trend here, the scatter plot. It looks like a, a, a gunshot blast, but a data here. And you can unfold it by looking at filtering, depending on heat treatments, filtering based on uh, nickel rich or nickel lean or 50 50 uh, filtering based on hysteresis you can apply those custom uh, filters for example cases in my design where i uh, i would like to look at single element of hafnium uh, elements i can come here and i know for example i want to make a rod so i'm not going to make it by uh, a melt spun for example i want to know also a test that is only corresponding to the axial constant force thermal cycling. This is an ASTM standard, or I only care about DSC, differential scanning colorimetry data, which is zero load. So I can select and deselect things here accordingly and populate this data. This data narrows down. More so, you can put one on top of it. If you, for example, you're only building a torsional actuator, you don't necessarily care about bending or, or, or other things. You can just come here and just uh, I'm not sure if there is any torsion. There's one data in torsion right here. There you go, for instance. But this is, gives you an idea of what kind of data you, you can uh, extract by using this tool. So that's uh, a quick uh, tutorial on using it. You can do the same thing for super elasticity here. Uh, this is not necessarily dealing with medical alloys, but you can uh, look at different elements and how they behave and what they do in nickel titanium for for example, tribology, bear, uh, uh, bearing alloys, uh, uh, gears, uh, super elastic tires, and what have you, that information can be found here. So you can plot your nickel ratio titanium. You can come here and do hardness in this case and look at what hardness is doing. 
to each value. You can plot the color as perhaps a heat treat, something that makes sense to you, to your design. Heat treat one is typically homogenization, which is mostly all the time the same temperature. But if you do heat treat two, which has some aging factors, you can see that the color start to pop. This is how you would use this tool to go directly to design what you need. Uh, the same thing for magnetic shape mermaid alloys. Uh, you can go in there and select nickel manganese based. Let's just do all of them also if you want. You can click in here, it's gonna populate all sort of data. You can study the manganese effect. Here, maybe you need the, uh, some other value like maximum magnetization field, which is a common value. And you can see how much data we have here for nickel manganese. Uh, manganese is a function of magnetization field and you can plot other things here that make sense to your design. And you can see how this areas here grow a lot because there's so many filters that we apply, different test methods, different test directions, and so on. When we come to polymers, there is a little different GUI here, graphical user interface, just because we had so many different categories on polymers. Uh, for those that work on shape energy polymers, we have a huge database. Uh, if you go to the sunburst here, you can see them here, how they're listed about 3000 or so papers. And the majority, the biggest one is epoxy. So if I go back here and I look for my epoxy and basically the tool functions the same way. There is fixity, which is an important value for, for sheet memory polymers as a function of recovery. You can come here and this will help you select the proper polymer that you would like to use. And you don't have to use one. You can look at two or three or four, click them all and they will populate around here. And depending on if there's data, if there's no data, they will show you uh, what's going on. Uh, at the moment, ceramics is under construction. So right now it's disabled, but soon this shimmer ceramics is under construction and then we'll, we will have it ready uh, anytime. So let me circle back to my presentation. Uh, one thing that I wanted also to, to, to show here is let's say you have your hafnium and alloys and you have your austenite start or finish and you have your martensite start and finish you get this trend you can do multi elements and click a bunch and see what they do and here is for example a trend now i'm just going to quickly just show you how we apply these tools now we're going to do it let's say we're going to do a clustering method okay and you're going to do it based on hysteresis select what kind of clustering method we have currently the k-means is loaded you're going to select a number of properties we'll preload this for you but you can go and change for example i want eight clusters and you simply apply that cluster and it's going to cluster those based on hysteresis okay so here uh, just like you would do for your statistic clustering k-means clustering which is a common method used to uh, to uh, group data this is exactly the method applied here let's say you don't want clustering you can clear but you want some sort of regression. You can do polynomial, you can regress, you can straight up do a fits, linear fits to come up with some slope. If you're interested in clausius clapeyron slopes, you can plot temperature as a function of stress. If you're interested in composition as a function of atomic percent, like how much temperature it, it adds or removes or decreases, you can get those slopes here and so on. So that's, that's what we currently have loaded for the basic and supervised uh, analysis tools. All right, here is that example again for the analysis tool. You can group them based on something else. This one was grouped based on temperature. And you can also do your basic fittings here to create this nice slopes that tells you per atomic percent you get X amount of temperature. And this, this slopes here means something. Why is it decreasing and increasing? For those of you that work with nickel, titanium, palladium, this has to do with the transformation path changes. It goes from a monoclinic to an orthorhombic, uh, but we won't get to that here. I just wanted to mention that you can really get some good science out of this information. Just to recap on the area of uh, uh, here, uh, for bearing alloy superelastic category, you can output information regarding the tribology components. In the area of uh, polymers, you can really export out all kind of in important information that will help you design I mentioned also that we're working on sheet memory ceramics. This is Syria dope zirconia. You can see that you can find nice trend with martensite finish temperatures, very, very high temperatures uh, that we get. All right, so that gives us a, a good uh, 
stopping point on the demonstration, but I want to leave you with some uh, information what we are up to here. Uh, we have big plans to come. We have not done with this, although the releases today, you can everybody can benefit from it for what we have, but we have big plans going forward, both near term and short term and longer term. Uh, let's say uh, the next thing that we're going to do, we're going to do data tables. Why data tables? Let's say you are an experimentalist or a modeler and you have new data and you just want to go to this tool and upload your data and look at it, let's compare it, see how it fits and so on. You can simply do that by following a table header or a template, type that data or paste it in there and you can visualize it right there. Now that data is only there for your session. It doesn't, it doesn't save. Once you close out, that data is gone. But we also have in tables that you can save that data. And how do we do that? Only for published data. If your data is published out there and you would like to add it to this database, there will be a prompt in there to allow you to share data. You follow the prompt, you send us that data, we screen it, make sure that it's published and the data is sound, and we just add it to the database. And within a week or so, we flush, we, we refresh, and then you have uh, your data included within everything else. We also working on an exporter. Let's say you want to transfer data to another package, maybe an FEA package or a machine learning package model. You can do that here too. Once, once that data is out through an APR or just a table, you can do whatever you want with it. So that's, that's an upcoming release in, in the near future. Another bigger thing that we do in here, uh, because we understand that so much data can be overwhelming. There's millions of data points in this database. For that reason, we are creating a handbook as a companion source at the leadership of Peter Cal Caltagiron here at NASA Glenn. Uh, the handbook will present the data in an organized manner uh, in, in, in a way to, to, to showcase the functional properties, the trends, the slopes, the tables, and we're making plots sort of like, if you're familiar with the Ashby plots, where you can uh, see the design space and pull data from it. Another thing coming up is also the supervised, in this case, machine learning models. Uh, our colleagues at NASA Ames at the leadership of, of Shreyas and John have developed models that are already trained and can be put good, to good use. So we are working with our uh, partners there to make that happen. We are also working with university partners, in this case with Professor Aaron Stevner and and uh, co-investigators uh, to come up with physics informed models, uh, also machine learning models. Those also will could plug in here and be available for the community uh, to work with. Here's a, a question uh, for everybody. How about the long-term uh, uh, goals? At least for us here at NASA, uh, we want to pose the question, how do we go from the test rig to the final resting point here in this case, which is this database? We want to capture that. Well, we have started some of that already. We want to capture the raw data. Uh, we want to capture the hysteresis curves. And we want to capture the, the superlastic curves and so on. So that's also being championed here by our NASA colleagues uh, at the helm of, of Steve Arnold, Fred Holland, and Brandon Harley, where they're coming up with tools to allow us to take data from the frames directly into a database that allows us to store raw data, st store plots, and even data points. But then when you have that data point, we need to be able to parse that data. So once we capture it, we want to be able to, to, to extract the information in some normalized, unified, standardized method following some ASTM standard, for example. So that is also nearly complete, and we're working with it at the leadership of Glenn Bigelow and, and Zach Toom here at GRC. So with that, as you can see, this is not just a database. It's not just a plotting tool. This is really a shape memory materials infrastructure built for the benefit of all. So we built it for our own NASA needs, our own requirements and help us design new alloys. And I had along the way many requests to get access to it. So finally, here it is. So now researchers uh, you know, out there can go use it to find new trends and gaps and opportunities. Designers can use it to select the starting material point. Educators, if you're an educator, you can use these to teach functional materials for grad schools or undergraduates, or if you're just curious and want to learn about, about SMAs and what, or not just SMAs, but materials, shape memory materials, then you are just a few clicks away. You can really just get this today and, and, and then go play with it. With that, I had the pleasure to talk with you today and demonstrate this tool, but please know, please know that there are many people behind the scenes that made this possible. 
Uh, this work was funded by the Transform Transformational Tools and Technology Project, part of the Aeronautics Mission Directorate. And our developers here at NASA Glenn have done a wonderful job in building the software and putting it together with this, all these interfaces and stuff. And of course, the, the contributors listed here, many of them are listed here that played a role in getting us here. Every small or big or big effort uh, that took place is, is appreciated and made this happen. And I hope I didn't forget anybody and I listed everybody that I, that I mingled with in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this sheet. All right, so thank you very much for joining us and we hope you find this tool useful. If you cannot find what you're looking for, uh, if you're mi we're missing some data, which we know we are, we've done what we could to collect as much as we could, but we know uh, the, it's manual labor, there could be some errors, or if you have any general questions, please feel free to reach out. You can use this email listed here to pose your questions. And thank you for your time. So I'm going to start out with, wow. Thank you, Dr. Benefan, for that um, excellent demonstration. That's quite a tool. And I have good news. That whole thing was recorded. So um, that's going to be super helpful because I know for myself, I'm going to have to go back and probably visit that just to get a grasp. And I'm going to, I think a lot of the audience is going to want to do that too. So I am going to reintroduce myself. I'm Jeannie King from the T2X uh, Glenn Research Center Technology Transfer Office. Before we get to the question and answer, I want to speak a little to the resources available through NASA and our office. NASA has 10 centers and seven facilities across the US with a headquarters located in Washington, DC. And in my role, I have the privilege of working with experts like Dr. Benefan and helping partners leverage his great work Today's focus on shape memory, uh, shape memory alloy very much showcases Dr. Benefan's contributions as a driven, prolific inventor. So great job today. Thank you. Uh, tech transfer is government mandated with the goal of um, developing partnership opportunities that promote innovation, commercialization, and new business growth, and enhance communication and collaboration with all sorts of partners. NASA has multiple programs and opportunities and solicitations available. Here's a sample of those um, available under the Space Technology Mission Directorate. Those outlined in orange are specific to our university partners. Um, to access some of these opportunities and to uh, find out a little bit more about them, the URL is at the bottom. You can also search STMD NASA and come to um, the same uh, URL there. There are three main ways to partner with NASA Tech Transfer. We have patent licensing, software usage agreement, and Space Act agreements. And we're gonna talk a little bit about those in the upcoming slides. So NASA's patent portfolio captures all intellectual property available for licensing. The uh, portfolio is divided in these 15 categories, which are searchable by keyword, or you can jump into the category through the T2 portal at technology.nasa.gov. Now, technology.nasa.gov, that's going to be one of the keys to um, really communicating with us and all the opportunities I'm going to talk about today, you're going to be able to find there. So all technologies available in NASA's patent portfolio have a patent summary sheet or a technology summary sheet accessible through the portal. The summary sheet provides a layman's description of the technology benefits and envisioned applications with direct links to the patent license application and to the tech transfer team email. In the next slide and this one, we're going to showcase the um, IP and the patents by Dr. Benefan and his team. The first one, the shape memory alloy enabled actuators. Um, outline elements to drive rotary and ring gear motion in actuators. The second, mechanisms for CubeSats, described as a retention release and deployment mechanism for solar arrays and antennas. And the third here, SpanWise Adaptive Wing, is an in-flight wing reconfigure reconfiguration actuator. On this next page, the first one here is described as a highly stable, heat-treatable, tunable material. 
The Shape Memory Alloy Rock Splitter, or SMARS, is a rock fracturing technology. And the last one here, the Shape Memory Alloy Art, or SMART, is a hands-on educational tool for SMA. So you can get a feel for the diverse suite of SMA-related uh, patents here done by Dr. Benefan and his team. The first partnering mechanism identified earlier is through licensing. And it's a simple process. You'll go to that technology.nasa.gov, locate your technology of interest. And on that sheet, uh, on that summary sheet, there's a little button there for apply for the license that fits your needs. And then the license will be executed through our office. NASA utilizes four main licensing types. Um, the first is the research license, which we see as a test drive or an opportunity to evaluate the technology. Um, the research license is a standard license, a one-year non-exclusive with set fee license. It's a great opportunity just to engage NASA and learn a little bit about the technology and um, do a little evaluation. The government use license is similar in its um, non-exclusive standard term set fee, um, where the partner can leverage NASA technologies for government-funded projects, including SBIR. The third is a commercial license, which is more of a custom license, and that's going to require additional information with the partner, and it has you can engage in varying levels of exclusivity and cost structure. So this license really engages the tech transfer team and the partner in discussion before it can be executed. And this final one um, for the entrepreneur spirit starting out is the NASA startup license. And that's available to launch a new business utilizing NASA technology. And the beauty in this license is it has favorable terms, including no upfront fee, no minimums for the first three years, and it really takes that much needed capital and keeps it in the hands of the partner so they can use it toward the development of the technology. We also have a T2X team at the center um, that is, has experience in the entrepreneur ecosystem resources to help those startups navigate the early stage of licensing and resources. So again, more information on that can be found on the T2 portal. So the next mechanism is software usage agreements, and that's another partnering tool. NASA has software as a free resource that is accessible through the software catalog at software.nasa.gov. You can also find your way there, again, through that T2 portal. NASA's software catalog is arranged in 15 categories and accessed through this user-friendly dashboard. Each category includes a summary of the type of codes available with a short description. For instance, this structures and mechanisms category is described as deployables, structural loading analysis and design, while materials and processes focuses on parts, manufacturing, production, and processes. So software requests, once you're in here, software requests are made electronically through that catalog. And the final means of um, engaging with the tech transfer office is through Space Act agreements. SAAs, as they are referred, are an effective tool to work closely with our NASA team and a, the best vehicle to engage our, resource, our researchers and uh, access our facilities. To engage, a statement of work or description of duties and responsibilities from each partner is required, along with timelines and milestones. Um, just to have it be known, there are no guarantees that NASA will be able to engage in the work requested as uh, the agreements can't interfere with the mission work where the government work takes precedence. But those can really be um, addressed on a case by case basis. So just contact your office and we can help navigate that. For university entrepreneur programs, NASA does have a new technology transfer university program that connects student entrepreneurs with NASA technology. Additional information, including highlights and the NASA point of contact can be found again at that T2 portal under resources T2U. 
So if nothing else, remember technology.nasa.gov, of course, alongside all of the great stuff that Atman told us about. But on technology.nasa.gov, you'll find our programs, information, uh, information, and emails. Once again, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Dr. Benefan, thank you so much. This is, this is amazing, and, and we appreciate you being here. Um, and have a good week, everybody. Thank you very much, everyone.